world, as you can tell. And this is something that uh, we, we need to consider. Many of you are strange to me, and, and I know that I'm strange <laughs> to those who know me best. But uh, just think, we come together, and the only credentials that we have is Jesus Christ. And yet we look at smiling faces, and we know that we are among friends. And wherever we go, and we find members of the church, that's true, isn't it? But that's true. Our credentials are Jesus Christ. And we must keep it ever that way. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Think of all the words that are said in this world. Think of the number of times that you hear brilliant men, the best our nation has to offer. And they come on television and they sound so wise and so smart. And then they're tripped up if anyone ever asks them the slightest <coughs> thing about the Bible they do not know because they have not studied because it is available to everyone to study and it is said and truthfully so that the best education or a better education would be a person who had not been to college but had a wonderful knowledge of the Bible much more so than a marvelous education in the best universities in the land and no knowledge of the Bible at all. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And you and I are responsible for the speech that we make. And the Bible talks about idle words, doesn't it? Now that doesn't mean that you can't have... Just go ahead. I'll get Okay. Uh, now that we're on a thing, get the things that drop. <laughs> you be responsible for the things that splash. <laughs> I don't have to hit this on you. I can make it on. Uh, this is always typical. That's why I have such a large preamble uh, uh, to my speaking. I have been known to be almost at the punchline when some little lady would finally say, we haven't heard a word you've said. <laughs> Can anybody not hear? That, that may be what you want. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll start again. We're responsible for the speech that we have. It does not mean that we cannot uh, have a light side, that we can't enjoy life and, and uh, uh, say things that are, are humorous uh, because God made and gave us a sense of humor. And he means for those things to lighten our lives because many times oppressive things happen. Honey, what I couldn't tell you about this past week, you would not believe. And any of those who are interested, see me after class <laughs> because I, I, can, I can tell you. But the heart of man, now the heart of us, our fleshly heart, this muscle, is responsible for the life's blood that we have that transverses our body and it purifies the blood that comes into it and when it leaves the heart the blood is fresh and pure but that is not the heart that the Bible is speaking about we cannot live without this fleshly heart of our bodies it would be a miserable life indeed if we tried to live without the heart that the Bible talks about. And that is the mind of man. This is the heart that the Bible speaks about. We are responsible for everything that the mind of man contains. It is a repository for all of the knowledge that we get through a lifetime. Little bitty children, and you know, you can remember things that happened back when you were two and three years old. Things that hit with an impetus that, that uh, just placed themselves in your memories so that you could think about them and recall them any number of times. All of the television that we watch goes into the mind and makes an impression there and stays there and we recall it for our use and this is why my dears that you need to watch what you watch on television 
Don't feel like in the cleanliness of my Christian home, I can watch all this trash. And because I don't do it, I won't be hurt. You need to be careful and you need to be discerning about the things that you put in your mind because it stays there. It is a computer bank that God made. And we're able to recall things that happened years and years and years ago. The novels that we read go into our minds. All the love that we feel. The movies that we see. Everything that we see or that we hear goes into our mind. Now then, I don't know about the filter there like the fleshly heart has that works on the blood and sends it out pure again. But God has fixed it, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, in a way that we can be in control of the things that are in our minds. You need to watch what your little children see. An excerpt from a little poem said, I saw tomorrow look at me through little children's eyes. And oh, how carefully we would teach if we were truly wise. You see, when we have children, we have launched a soul into eternity. And for the few short years, we can shape the lives and train them. Oh, how we need to be doing it. Train up a child in the way it should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. Now, training is far different from just having a little child and, and giving it a birthday party once a year. The parties are fine. That's the way you get a bunch of candy that you can eat after the kids go home or whatever it is. But that is not the training of the child. If you want your child to be Christian, you need to aim the child in that direction. And it all needs to be slanted that way because you are programming that little computer for that child for its life. But you see, we can have treasure here or trash or trash. The novels that we read some days, have, I mean, uh, sometimes today have brilliant narrative lines, wonderful stories. But the authors feel compelled to seed all through their obscenities to make it palatable to the national mind. Now, isn't that a terrible thing? That in all our country, we have a mind bent that we need a little trash to be palatable. Well, if we are the only ones in this whole world that are opposed to that, let you and I stand fast in what we believe, in what we believe. And when we have opportunities, encourage others to leave the trash alone. I'm going to have to eat it. <laughs> There is a way, and I have found it. No, I haven't. <laughs> oh. Just enjoy this. Uh, oh, I don't know how it'll come out. But our minds is the sum of all that we are, of all that we are. And you can't have a dirty mind without some dirty conversation now and then. And uh, Christians are not entitled to cursing. And yet I have known some who just say, well, I just feel like I've got to have a little outlet some way. And this word or that word is just what I, what I say. Now, let me tell you, boys and girls, you need to be Christian from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. And if you know enough that something's wrong, that you feel like you need to explain it to someone, look at it again. That's something you need to leave off. That's something you need to leave off. This subject is handled many times throughout the Bible. The tongue and what it does and uh, whether or not we are truly good or whether we uh, just sort of play at being Christian. There's really no such thing. There's really no such thing.
you are either Christian or you are not Christian. Not Christian. And we need to lay aside all filthiness. Does that sound like scripture to you? It is. Lay it aside and don't do it. And God will help you. But the initiative has to be yours and has to be mine. We have to show God that we really mean to be Christian and that we really mean to have clean minds. And then God, God will help us. But if we're just playing at it, we probably are playing by ourselves. Now, there is a scripture that says, He who formed the eye, can he not see? And he who made the ear, does he not hear? And he who giveth knowledge, does he not know? Well, of course, that's, that's God. I think that's in one of the Psalms. And I, that's as much as I can pin it down. It's in one of the Psalms. But you see, what this makes us know is that you and I, what we say, what we think, what we do is always known to God. It's always known to God. Everything we think, everything that we say, whether any of our friends know about it or not, God knows. Now, you see what that should do? That should rid us of this feeling of not uh, admitting that we do things that are wrong. That we feel like, well, we've got some secrets that are hidden and no one needs to know this. I think all of us do things of which we're not proud you know, and, and what we wish we would not do. Uh, I am constantly uh, changing and, and uh, uh, feeling disappointed in myself. And I suppose that that's perfectly natural as long as we are striving to do uh, the best that we can. But God gave us a tongue. And just think how wonderful communication is. They say one of the greatest things that a person can be is a good communicator. You'd agree to that, wouldn't you? If you can, if you have good ideas and you can communicate them to other people, that is one of the most important things in this world today. You know, the complimentary things that they said about Reagan, one of the outstanding things was he's one of the best communicators that's ever been in the White House. The things that he feel, felt, the things that he did, his, the things that he stood for, he could communicate them to other people. Well, now you and I need to be working on that. The tongue helps us. It helps us to talk about it. So there we have the printout for the computer. This tongue forms its conversations and what it does from the things that are in our mind. Out of the abundance of all of the information that's gone in, the mouth speaketh. And that's what we want to consider now. Our tongues use the data that we have in our minds. But it can get out of control. Now, I know that none of you are guilty of this. But have you ever known anyone that talked too much? <laughs> hey, uh, Sue, you remember, uh, this is my friend here. And I want you to know that we're on thin ground. It, it, it's ice here because when we we went on a trip together and she was uh, going on into the night with her conversation <laughs> and I finally said Sue turn on the light and she turned on her light I said see my eyes they're closed <laughs> will you hush so that, that's the way we work, isn't that right? That's the way, that's the way that we work. But uh, the talking too much is not what, I'm, uh, what I mean here so much as there are people who feel like they've got to tell everything that they know. And you better watch that, hadn't you? They are channels of information. They're channels of information. You better see that you're not one. I believe that every mature person in this room knows what gossip is. And some people tell it thinking, well, it's, it's true, therefore it's all right to tell. And that is not so. Sometimes a bad truth needs to be kept a secret 
a whole lot more than a lie. A lie will just be found out. But this tongue of ours can get us into a lot of trouble. And it can get out of control. And in James it says it is a raging fire. And you know the damage that a fire does. It is a raging fire. Now this is God's description of the tongue that God made. But you see, we are made creatures of our own volition. We are in control of our bodies. We do things that we know uh, to be right or that we want to do. And if you say something, you cannot say when you're caught, at, caught into it, you cannot say, well, I just spoke without thinking. That's not so. Because in order to have speech, you have to have the thought behind it. Now, what you probably meant was, I had not thought about the consequences of this. I didn't know I was going to be found out. I, I, I didn't know it was going to get back to them so quickly, or I, uh, I would have changed it. But just think, if every Christian would never repeat any gossip that they heard, or any bad tales that they heard. Think of what a good influence that we could be in this world if people would say, they don't gossip. But sometimes people feel like that they're entitled to gossip. Well, I'm not going to talk about anyone that's not in the church. It's just kind of uh, between us. So that, that'll make it all right. But there is never a place for gossip. It is a raging fire. And there are many people throughout this world and throughout time who have caused nations to fall, caused wars by using this tongue in a non-Christian way. Now, you know, the Christians are outnumbered in this world, aren't they? So you and I have to stand for right and, and truth stronger than ever. And we need to seek out good men and pray that God will raise them up to high places. Because who knows whether the cup of iniquity of America is ready to slosh over. Ready to slosh over. We need to be serious about being a Christian. And you and I need to be guarding our tongues. It's set on fire of hell, the Bible says. And it also says that it is uh, uh, that no one can tame the tongue. No one can tame the tongue. Well, isn't that a fearsome thing to think about? But we can control it. And then it goes, the, in James it goes on to say that you have a big strong horse and it can be controlled by this little bridle that goes right in his mouth. And it presses in such a way that if you want to turn him to the right, that horse is going to go that way. And he's going to go this way. And that little bitty bridle controls the action of that great big horse. Well, God was not just putting a little truth in there that we could see it. He was teaching a lesson, he's going to say. Now, you had this fearsome member of your body that no man can tame. But it can be controlled easily. And one of the ways is your computer bank. If you pray that God will help you to do good and to lay aside all evil, and then you begin to fill your mind with the truths of the Bible, then you're going to find out that you're going to be a much better person and that you will be talking and speaking as the oracles of God. You will be a loving and loving person. And you don't need to take my word for that because you can take the Bible's word for it. We can all shape up to be pretty good people if we are filling our minds with the truth of the scriptures. And it's in here. It's in here. Everything that pertains to life and to godliness is in this book. Now, you can tell that this is not a coffee table book, can't you? 
We don't need to have Bibles that just sit on coffee tables, but you and I need to be students of the Bible. We need to know the truths that it teaches. And we need to be able to give an answer to any man that asks us a reason for the hope that's in us. Now that's a command that's in the Bible. And you may not know it today, but by tomorrow you ought to be a little bit smarter than today. And you ought to be getting into some kind of study if you have to do it all by yourself. That really is the best time. And help God to, uh, ask God to help you find truth and not draw false conclusions. And that you will be able to be a good influence to other people. And put out the fire, the flaming fire of this raging tongue. Just think how much we all speak. How much we all speak. It needs to be for good. The controlling is the truths that we learn from reading in the Bible. Now, there are productive uses of the tongue. We talk about the things that will be destroyed by the tongue. You know the little song, angry words, oh, let them never from the tongue unbridled slip. Read that sometime and just think about that. I don't know whether you have ever destroyed a friendship or not with a sharp word that, that you made. But it happens all the time. And you need to stop and think before you talk. Because sometimes you cannot, uh, you may get forgiveness for that, but you may not be able to correct that mistake. Did you know it? Most of my family, those that are older than I am, have passed along, and I'm now the matriarch, even among the cousins. I'm the, it's my turn next. Um, I'm the oldest uh, survivor. And I think about crosswords that I've had with these beloved people that went on before and think, well, what a terrible thing. And it was just something that I said. I meant what I said at the time. But I meant for it just to be words that hung in the air a little while and then dissipated like a little smoke would do. I didn't mean it to be an arrow that I shot into the air. And when we found it, it was in the heart of a friend. You can see how I remember poetry, can't you? Just a word here and a word there. I may rewrite it someday, and I don't think the author would ever recognize his work. But, uh, but you see that. You don't know where this is going to end up when, when you're talking about it. You do not know. But we're going to back, go back now and talk about the benefit, beneficial uses of the tongue. Think of the artists that teach art. And men who teach mathematics or women who te teach mathematics. Science. Think of all of the wonderful things that the smart people in this world are doing. And they have to be taught by the word of the mouth with someone that has the know-how and the savvy and all the information so that they can impart this information to. Now that's a wonderful work of the tongue. They have to be taught. They have to be taught. Underwater exploration. Yeah, you know that there's no such thing as just putting on your bathing suit and getting some fins and going down and coming up uh, out of the ocean with a lot of knowledge. Someone has to tell you what to look for and how to do it and how to breathe and everything. And teachers are communicators the most important people in all of the world who use their tongues daily to impart valuable information that enrich our lives that enrich our lives we you and I glorify God with our tongues and I hope that every person in this room Praise daily, often to God. Not only prayers of petition and helping you and your family uh, to be better Christian, but what does it say? Be anxious in nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. What? With thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. 
Don't pray without thinking, thanking God. Because if you and I were never blessed anymore in our lives, we would have to honestly say that we've been far blessed far more than we ever deserved. Because you see, God blesses us every single day. Every single day. We praise God in our prayer. Hallowed be thy name, O great and almighty God. Every prayer that we say is to praise God. Psalms 50 and 23 says, Whoso offereth praise glorifies God. And all of our prayers should have in it praise for the Almighty. Praise for the Almighty who spoke the world into being, who has given us those we love and those who love us. You and I could never write long enough without getting writer's cramped if we begin to number all of the blessings that we have. Just never could do it. Because God blesses us every day of our lives. He has given us life and he has given us breath and he has given us our souls and he has given us the remission of sins and he has given us the plan of salvation and every one of us in here would be lost eternally if this had not been God's plan and Jesus fulfilled it. So you see, we can have thankful hearts and praise God. John 17 and 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So if you love truth and if you want truth, look for it. What does the Bible say about the seeker? Seek and you'll find. Don't just look for one little spot, but start at the front and go to the back and spend time in study. Even if you have to get up earlier in the morning, earlier in the morning than you usually do, and have what Carl Burkeen says is a quiet time. You and your Bible, which puts you in touch with God, to feed into this bank and into this heart God's words. Now, there was a time in my life when I was a worldly person. And when I set out to become a Christian, to live a Christian life, I thought I was a Christian because I had been baptized. But you see, I was not improving in the Christian life at all. Just sort of a stagnation there. But then I began to study the Bible and to read it. And do you know that I could hardly wait to put my little children to bed at night? But, well, that goes without saying. But <laughs> uh, so that I could sit down. There, there's one of my children right there um, who is an oppressed child. But uh, anyway, so that I could read the Bible. And many times I would be reading when dawn streaked the sky and I am telling you the truth. Thrilled to death with the truth that was there. Now, one time I was selling houses on a project, you know, where you're in a model home and you're waiting for someone with more money than they know what to do with to come in and buy a house. Well, I always took my Bible on the job. And when I started reading that from Genesis through to Revelation, do you know that I resented the customers? <laughs> I, I really did. If someone would drive up, I'd, you know, I did not want to be bothered. But it had been there all along, but I had not, my spirit had not begun to eat of the spiritual food that the Bible afforded. And you can sit on the sidelines all your life and be satisfied with coming to church on Sunday. And if nothing happens, come back on Sunday night. And if nothing happens, come back on Wednesday and just feel like you've got it made. Or you can get with it here and make God your friend and Jesus your friend and learn what these scriptures say and live a life that is far richer than anything that you ever believed. And who knows? You may even be of good influence to some friends. And you may be able to persuade others to be Christians. But you'll never do it until you assimilate the truths that are there. The truths that are there. 
And it is not so for you to say, and I don't want you to say to me, I just don't remember the scriptures like I used to. You know why? You're not exercising the muscle. You're not exercising the muscle. Start with Jesus wept. <laughs> Everybody can remember that. Um, but start with a favorite passage or two. And then every morning or every night or every time you have a little quiet time or just some time, repeat that. And then the next night or the next day, learn another one and repeat both of them. You see, that that's a, that's a way to do it. And that is exercising the muscle. Now, the Bible tells us that bodily exercise does profit a little, but the exercise of the mind is the thing that is going to do wonders for us. Now, do you think God didn't know what he's talking about? <laughs> he gave you your mind. And if you pray, help me to remember the scriptures, I want to do it, then you'll find out that your life will begin to change, that it will begin to change. The recent exposure on TV of the uh, ministers, the uh, preachers, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Now, these men apparently did not have the love of the truth of God in their hearts. They lived the most worldly lives that you can imagine. And it finally hit the fan. And now everybody knows what they thought was a secret. They were living double lives. And here was one image that they had that made everybody in the whole world that had a dollar say, I want him to have it and mail that money in. And they looked pure and fine and sweet and good and on fire for the Lord. But that wasn't the way it was, was it? No, we see corruption and error. And you remember that God can cause it to crumble anytime that he wants to, but that has put the focus and the blame on all of the church. And we suffer because of that. All of the churches, whether they have truth or not, have been put under this cloud of suspicion, this cloud of derision, and we're going to have to overcome that. We're going to have to overcome that. But let us speak truth, and let us begin to arm ourselves with the armor of God that we may be able to uh, bring our church out of it. We are the church. We are the church. Teaching the word is another a productive use of the tongue. Think of the men who have prepared their lives or who have spent their lives being able to preach. And ladies who have uh, decided that they want to teach. I feel like if I can do it, you can do it. And when they asked me to teach years ago, I thought, boy, the church is in trouble. <laughs> you know, last ditch, staying in so on. Then I, uh, I, I really, I thought, well, they're crazy. They, they just are crazy. But then I thought, if I can do it, I must do it. So I went into a little class, and the preacher's son was one of the children. With Rita Rhodes Ward. Now, how many of you have ever taught her little class? And I had about five minutes of uh, religious material to give those little children, fourth grade. I had 27 songs, <laughs> you know, to beef it up a little. And the memory verse that I worked all week on, hoping that, that I would get it. But now, I mean, really, really. And see, all you need is just one lesson at a time ahead of the children. That, that's all you need. So don't think you can't do it. Just take your little lesson, say, I'll go in and say a few wise words, even if I have to say, quote, and unquote, you know, this is what, what they said. When I called the role in this little class, I used all three names. <laughs> and if I knew their parents' names, I said, begat by so-and-so, begat, you know, uh, anything to use up the time. 
<laughs> but as time went on, you see the difference? I don't hush now. <laughs> and the ladies that attend the Bible class that I teach know that I have never yet finished a lesson. <laughs> now, none of them have ever come at the end of the class and thrown themselves at my feet and said, tell me the rest of it. Now, they never have done that. <laughs> but I'm probably the one that they know that has the tongue that blabs too much. But bearing fruit is another um, productive use of the tongue. You will have a thrill that you cannot imagine when you bring a soul to Christ. When you bring a soul to Christ. And if you haven't done it, get busy with it. You see, there's so many things that distract people today that the big meetings that they used to have for three weeks, three or four times a year, and everyone flocked, those don't go over so much now for the simple reason that there are so many distractions. We're coming back to the way that God had it anyway, and I don't mean that, that this was ruled out as, as wrong, but where one-on-one on, one on one is most effective. You and I, talking together with a coffee cup about why we feel the way we feel, with an open Bible, and let them, the person that we're talking to, let them read, and let's discuss the scripture, and don't fail to use, say, well, let's see what the Lord says about it and read the Bible because you never need to be afraid of the declared word of God and don't feel like that you in your wisdom need to edit what God said or, or soft soap or, or soft pedal it or something because what does God say about his word sharper than a two edged sword it doesn't mean you're supposed to be ugly doing it but it does mean you're supposed to be telling it like it is, the very truth of God, the very truth of God. And you see, it's only the truth that's going to win anyway. And that's what, what you and I want, one-on-one. -on -one. But now out of the mouth, we speak evil things. You think that's true? You watch television and see all of the nasty obscenities and the evil that is done there. The evil that is done between uh, leaders of nations, carping and calling one another names and, and using this tongue that God meant to bless to wreak havoc upon the people of the world. We do that with our mouths, with our tongues. And we speak folly. We speak foolish things. Now, I'm going to do this. And I'm going to do that. And we just talk about things and we're making plans. And what does the little parable say about the man who just had so much money and he was going to tear down his barns and build bigger barns. And then he'd have space for these things that he had. And what happened? Oh, thou fool. Tonight thy soul shall be required of thee. Now you and I don't know what this afternoon happen, is going to happen. Or tonight or tomorrow or this very, very minute. But we need to be making things right if we can and doing the very best that we can and not be so much on this I can and I am <coughs> and what I do. But we're all here by the grace of God and we need to be walking in the paths that He's trying to direct us in. But folly. We don't want to be foolish at all. And we speak lies. Now don't anyone move a muscle because I'm not going to say how many of you have ever told a lie. But lies are the fabrication of the world these days. And if you notice when these people in high places are caught red-handed having done something that the whole world is shocked at. They don't have any abiding sense of guilt. They just give a little excuse and even lie out of it. And the lie has no place in the heart or the mind of a Christian. It doesn't need to be in our data bank. And there are gentle ways to tell the truth. 
But one of the loveliest things in this world is to know you can keep your mouth shut and that you don't have to have a verbal opinion on everything that comes your way. My precious husband, and I thank God for him. And I know that God loved me because he gave me that man for my husband. But he said to me, he had a wonderful sense of humor. I hope he meant it humorously. But he'd say, Val, you can quit talking now anytime because I've quit listening. <laughs> and uh, I heard the other day that my son-in-law uh, said this about, he said, I really learned a lot from Frank. He said, one of the things that I learned about him was that you don't have to be talking all the time. And his ploy that he used, because this was a part of his personal, you didn't argue with Frank because he wouldn't argue. So you see, that's how I learned to take both sides of the issue. <laughs> but anyway, when people would come into the place of business mad and going to bawl everybody out in there, he'd just sit and let them blow off the steam. And then when they'd get through, and they'd shot off everything they could. Then he'd say, well, let's see what we can do about it. Calmly and gently. Well, the person, they weren't mad anymore. They'd already gotten it out of their system. And it worked beautifully. It worked beautifully. And my son-in-law has learned that. So now when I talk to him a lot of times, he doesn't say a word. And, <laughs> and that's because he's, he remembers what his uh, father-in-law did. But anyway, you like to realize that uh, your loved ones have taught other things. But now, that's something all of us can learn. I find myself, someone will say, now, well, what do you think about so-and-so? I'll tell them without waiting very much. Well, there's a scripture that says, out of much talking, there wanteth not sin. And you can just know that if you're talking all the time, you are bound to have slipped over into error. Like on these glassy streets that we have, you may not even know known you've changed lanes <laughs> and be right over there saying the things that are, are not so. That are not so. It's this very same mouth that speaks wisdom. Wise things. Wise things. And I'm a far, far different person than I used to be. And I know a lot more scripture than I used to know. But I meant to do it. I meant to do it. And that's how you can do it, is that you mean to do it. And as I told you, I was in the world a worldly person. And my prayer to God was that I would be the last one in my family who would crucify Christ afresh. And that I would train my children to lead Christian lives and slant them that way. And you can do it. Anyone can do it. Because you're going to be doing it with God's help. And that's what he wants anyway. And he has never asked man to do anything at any time that he didn't give him the strength and the direction as to how to do it. As to how to do it. And many times, as Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me. And then right after that, he says, for your burden is easy and light. Because then he's helping carry. He's helping do it. So many times, the initiative just has to be the picking up the cross. And we speak love. How thankful I am that I recall the love talk that my husband and I had together that I knew that he loved me and was I ever grateful for it. And he knew that I loved him. In fact, the few times that I intended to call out his flawed nature, I would say, well, I'm going to tell him about this. Then I, my next thought was, if I tell him about the flaws in his character, I'll have to let him tell me mine. And, you know, that'll straighten me out a lot of times. <laughs> I didn't need to hear that. I didn't want to hear that. But I remember that he loved me. 
And I remember the love of these other relatives that have gone on. And I'm glad that they knew that I loved them. And our family has always had a lot of love. I mean, down into the second and the third generations. We loved the cousins. We loved everybody. We loved everybody. Now, there, there were two cousins that were at cross points. I always have to stop and tell these little asides. Actually, I'm bearing my heart to you. Um, we were preparing a Thanksgiving dinner in the kitchen. And you know how there's, when ladies are working, this chatter just going on all the time. Well, this one cousin, oh, A, her name came up and she wasn't there. You see, you need to attend these things <laughs> um, if you want to protect yourself. But anyway, oh, they were talking about these strange traits that they had. And, and don't they, though? Don't our cousins ever have strange traits? Um, anyway, there's one cousin, she, B cousin. She's just there, just peeling potatoes or, or doing something like that. So finally, after they had just given Cousin A just down the country and everybody had said what they thought about it, she said, well, I just don't have any use for her. I said, have you ever watched the way she peels potatoes? <laughs> <laughs> now, you see, a little thing can just send you rolling off, but apparently that was the thing that she didn't like about Cousin A. But anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. All right. We speak love. Now, think of the beautiful love of a mother talking to uh, little children. And it has been my pleasure to see my lovely daughters. Now, you see, I can tell you all about my children. I do not want to hear about yours. <laughs> I don't want to hear about your grandchildren. I don't. That's out. But I can tell you about mine. But. I'm proud of the kind of mothers that they are. And I was the kind of mother that would grab him up by the collar, you know, and just shake him like, I don't know that I was as bad, but I wasn't as good as they think I am today. But they are patient with their children, and they are teaching them what is right, not what is wrong. And see, I guess they're learning to be teachers, help them that way, because teachers in the low grades realize that you cannot tell a child that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, and have this child turn out to be anything. But rather, if they are wrong, then you need to go to them and say, now let me show you a better way to do that. Or let me show you how you can get around this. You see? And that's what we all need. Don't you blossom under praise when someone is bragging on you. And don't you wilt under criticism. Now listen, I doubt seriously that there is such a thing as constructive criticism. You can always get around it and tell it a different, a different way. And not ever say, now this will really help you. This will really help you and criticize that person. But give them the benefit of your experience. If you know a better way to do it, say, this is the way I always did it. And you can say it in a way that no one is offended. But we want to speak love and just think how precious it is. I can recall my mother sitting by me in church and her voice raised in song. And I would not take anything at all for that memory. And her voice was probably like mine. It was not music. It was a joyful noise. But anyway, it thrilled me. And oh, love talk. These are memories that you're going to need someday. And we want to make as many pleasant ones as we can. And this tongue of ours can speak the words of love to little children to our mates, to loving relatives, to our parents. And we want to use it in good ways, don't we? We want to use it in good ways. And we praise God. Oh, thank thee, God, that things are as well with us as they are. <coughs> there was a dear elder at Polly, Brother Stevenson Alta, and he would always pray, Help us, thank thee that things are as well with us as we are. And then toward the end of his prayer, he would say, and take us all to heaven without the loss of one. Now, you see, those are words of love, and that man meant that.
And he didn't intend to leave that out of his prayer. And it never became an idle or a vain thought or word. But he loved the people of the church. And he didn't want any of them to be lost. And we praise God and we praise others. Now, I'm going to stop for just a minute and we'll all have coffee and sandwiches. No. Uh, and I'm going to praise my friend. Uh, I am camping out at her house. I haven't had any water in my house since New Year's Eve. I live in an old house. It's the only one in the neighborhood that looks like it's haunted. <laughs> but there isn't anything underneath the house that's working. It will have to be plumbed from the street clear on back. And not only that, but they had to order the parts. <laughs> Well, I carried gallons and gallons and gallons of water in. So anyway, my friend all the time said, come to my house. Well, last weekend I went to a motel. But this time I thought, that would be an insult to my friend if I went back to a motel when she's asking me to go to her house. And I will go and give her an opportunity to do a Christian service. And really that's what she's doing. And she is the loveliest hostess that you can imagine. I have felt like a cherished object. Now, it isn't all wonderful because when she takes my things out of the dryer, she folds them wrong. <laughs> but anyway, uh, she cooks, she does, she does everything. And if you'll see me after class, I will give you her phone number and address. And you can go over there because she will treat everyone just the way that, uh, that she treats me. But I want to praise that friend because she's gracious and she's lovely and she's loving. And it never entered my mind one time that I would not be welcome there. It is true that the second morning at breakfast, when she wakened me from my private suite with my own bath and everything, she did say, do you want any breakfast? I've already had mine. <laughs> so that was, I thought, well, am I getting a message here? Should I have it? So then I went into the breakfast table, and my placemat had little bitty napkin rings with a little white pig. And that little white pig was looking at me uh, just like that. And I thought, is she trying to tell me that the end of my visit is that I had stayed far longer than I'd been anticipating. <laughs> well, anyway, I praise you, Sue Watts, because you are one of life's lovely people. You say that. Is it afternoon yet? Yes, it is. But the conclusion of all of this is that think of the good that could be accomplished in this world if you and I were as good as we ought to be. And if we were as good as God knows we can be, and if we just made up our minds that we were going to lay aside the things in our lives that will hinder us on the way to heaven and that we're going to be better Christians all the time. Now, I'm going to read Proverbs 3, and if I mark this right, it's 3, 23 and 24. And I learned a long time ago that Proverbs is pretty close to the uh, middle of the book. Twenty-three and twenty-four, Proverbs three twenty-three and twenty-four. Now, if you do these things that God has asked you to do, then shalt thou walk in thy way safely, and thy foot shall not stumble. And when thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet the precious promises of the God of heaven. And you and I need to watch our mouths because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. I thank you for coming. I'm glad none of you tried to leave because I have two guards over here on this door. Uh, I have one of my daughters out taking the license numbers of the cars that left early. But anyway, I appreciate your coming because a teacher just needs someone to listen. Thank you. Let's see if we can get you in here.